And now we want to talk about what can be done and how we can uh, collaborate to tackle these issues. And I don't need to introduce myself because Stormy did it, thank you. So I'm very happy to uh, keep the experts in now, and that's for, uh, for the starters. It's uh, Ms. Liesel France. She's the acting deputy coordinator in the office of the coordinator for cyber issues of the US Department of State. Welcome, very nice to have you. Thank you for making it. And there's Anne Schoenbaum. He's the president of the Federal Office for Informational S Security, which you all know maybe under the name BSE. So to start, thank you for making it. And uh, we will have uh, 30 minutes of discussion. And afterwards, you are very invited to ask your own questions, and we will discuss them together. So a question to start with, Ms. Franz. Um, when we talk, when you look into Germany and the German mentality on tackling cybersecurity, what is the thing you admire? What's the thing you think, well, that's something we need too in the United States? Oh, wow. Well, well um, there's a lot to admire, actually. And we have been working very closely with Germany uh, over a, very many years, um, including looking at uh, incident response and uh, cybersecurity needs for a very long time. So uh, I guess I admire the uh, foresight and the um, the continued focus on cyber and cyber uh, security issues that uh, Germany has had. And I I, say, I would say that I appreciate that we um, both that Germany and the United States approach the is important issue in the spirit of partnership, not just with each other, certainly, but with other uh, countries as well, and recognizing that that we really are stronger together. Um, you know, years ago, we we worked together with Germany to start um, a uh, um, incident response policy and law enforcement community. Um, and I think that that partnership uh, uh, remains today. And we have been able to use um, that partnership to work together to understand and mitigate the threats that we see and also um, find ways to um, really address them in not only technical ways, but also in um, uh, in discussion and dialogue and in, I guess what I would say, uh, attribution. Mm -hmm. um, if we see, um, you know, the solar winds uh, incident, the Microsoft Exchange hacks earlier this year, the Ghostwriter campaign that, that targeted Germany, and being able to compare our experiences, safeguarding our de democratic elections from external cyber threats, and really calling out this this what we call malicious cyber behavior and we really appreciated um, Germany's efforts to do that as well and and also the strong uh, role that Germany has in the European Union uh, and and pushing that discussion into that into that venue as well so um, we also have been dealing with obviously the uh, um, dealing with ransomware attacks and the the uh, United States started a counter ransomware initiative with countries like Germany and uh, uh, thanks to Germany for chairing the diplomatic track of that effort. So I would say um, I admire the longstanding uh, leadership and, and partnership that we have with Germany. Thank you. So Mr. Schumann, what's your answer? <clears throat> there are so many <clears throat> different ways uh, different areas what we can admire from the United States. One is um, what Ms. Franz has already said is regarding the areas of, let's say, partnership and cooperation. I would add, if I may, so one area, this is friendship. I think um, our two countries are, are real friends. And there we are working very close together. And that, that's not just a rational behind it, but this is also a kind of feeling behind it. And that's where I'm very grateful for. And what I admire that uh, if you are, if you have generated this kind of friendship, it's a long-standing friendship and partnership. And this is what I admire there in, within the US. The other area is of course, the so-called can-do mentality. And this is what you see very strong in the area of, let's say, innovation. 
like for example on the industry side and the entrepreneurial side um, when i look to the facebook's amazon's google's or alphabets of this world or tesla i think there's a, a very strong creative um, potential in, in this area and i think this is something what can be also a kind of benchmark for us within Germany. And then number three is, from my perspective is, not just talking, but also walking. So I think it is great that there, um, when I, if I remember well, when we met last time in uh, Washington, uh, uh, with France, right? And then uh, the German embassy, Whenever I look to the different kind of discussions we are facing with Caesar and, and the other guys within the administration. And there, I, I must say, what I admire always very strong is that it's a creation of a plan and then implement this kind of plan. Just do it. And I think this is great and this is um, very important in this world in a digital way because this is a basis and a fundament for being successful information security for, for us as you know is a precondition of uh, successful digitization and therefore we, we i think have lots of commonalities to cooperate on in this area thank you mr schoenbaum you mentioned the can do mentality and uh, you could say that the trillion dollar package of the biden administration is also a can do thing and it's not only about infrastructure like mobility or or energy, it's also about cybersecurity. So Mrs. Franz, maybe you can elaborate a little bit about what is planned and what's going to change under this package and this investment, this huge investment into cybersecurity. We can't hear you at the moment. <laughs> there we go, can you hear yeah, me now? Yeah, perfect, yes, thank you. <laughs> After so many uh, of these virtual meetings, you think yes, that would be the forgot. first, <laughs> the first thing. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, one thing I'd like to say is that I think we have seen over the years an evolving, but yet sort of remarkable change on the focus on cybersecurity in at the, the top levels of, of government. And that has been uh, very welcome. So when you see, uh, uh, new uh, policy or new packages or investment, uh, it's very it's very welcome. You know, here at the State Department, we work on international diplomatic engagement, but our um, efforts are complement and are strengthened by our strong partners in the U.S. government uh, that are are doing more of the practical work to build um build technical resilience and incident response capacity. So with regard to the infrastructure package you mentioned, the largest share of cybersecurity related funding is for a $1 billion fund that will help state and local governments improve their cybersecurity preparedness. Um, we have our own version of a federated system, I suppose I would say. Yes. And, uh, and uh, that, so that is, uh, I think will be very welcome in that, in that regard. Um, uh, there's a separate $1 million, $100 million fund that will pay for response and recovery efforts from significant cyber incidents and that and then other funding goes to research to implement cybersecurity upgrades for uh, specific critical infrastructure sectors like public water systems, transportation systems and energy grids, which then you can sort of see is part of the, uh, the uh, infrastructure package. Um, so that's the kind of thing that th th those kinds of um, investments are, I would say, uh, I would say probably the newest element mm -hmm. of the, the sort of evolving uh, policy and attention to uh, cybersecurity over the years. Um, and you were in, in Congress, there's a debate about the obligation to report ransomware attacks. If you pay a ransom, you have to inform the federal office. So is that something, Mr. Schönbaum, this regulation of the private sector and to learn more about incidents that happen that you wish for too, would that something be, we have that for critical infrastructure, of course, but is that something that we need in Germany as well? Now you're mute too. You see, it happens to the best, so. Follow, follow the leader, so sorry. <laughs> so, um, so um, but, but I hope I, I did your, your question right. Uh, 
Johannes. So, so if I understand well, we need something like a kind of, let's say, um, uh, a report. Yes. If, if you are, if if you have have a certain kind of attack. Yeah. So this is something, as you know very well, we have implemented since uh, 2016 with the IT security law 1.0. And we have enlarged it even on the IT, IT security law 2.0. And uh, as you know, currently, I think there are some discussions ongoing if it is legally still possible that you are paying a kind of ransomware mm -hmm. or not. This is, I think, currently under discussion of the, uh, within the conference of ministers of Interior, um, uh, if I read it correctly. So, so this is something I'm very easy. I like to get all the reports I can get so that I can have an overall situational picture. And that's what I need, these kind of reports. I need not just regionally and nationally, but also on the European scale and then on the international scale. And that's why I think it's so important that we are exchanging very close with our partners, for example, with CISA in the US, or also with, with NSA and the other partners we're having. So this is something what is of utmost importance for us so that we have an overall situational picture so that we can exchange views if we see some, let's say, new attacks like from Emotet coming, for example, um, the re rebirth of, a, of the dead king. If we see additional, let's say, users, usages of, um, of uh, weaknesses on Microsoft Exchange, what we are just seeing currently, where we are seeing uh, of, of the weakness here, and uh, if we, for example, see hey, that 3,000 uh, servers in Germany are not yet, let's say, updated and fixed, even if they had a month of time for fixing it. So, so these are areas what we have to identify, and yes, I would get as, as many reports as possible. So, Mrs. Franz, I, I best thank you. Uh, that is something you would wish for too, right? Well, we certainly... Um uh agree that the the situ building the situational awareness um uh picture is part of the part of the ability to address it uh we do have um again back to our federated system <laughs> we do have um breach notification legislation or laws in most states if not all states at this point um for uh companies or entities that need to uh report report on uh breaches that they see that reach a certain threshold of the number of people that they might uh that they might um uh touch um, and so there's a similar, there's an, uh, have, has been for many years an attempt to make that a more national, uh, national law. And uh, as you rightly note, there is a discussion in Congress about um, uh, requiring reporting for uh, ransomware incidents and ransomware payments. Uh, where that will end up, I'm not entirely sure, but um, yes, there is an active, uh, active debate. And of course, those in uh, those of us in government, uh, like like uh, Mr. Schumann says, the more we know, the more we can uh, try to address, uh, not only directly as government, but also in partnership with the private sector and the technical community. Thank you. So um, you mentioned the cooperation between both of our countries, and uh, Mr. Schumann, you said um, we are friends. So how does this friendship look like on a daily or not a daily but you know in the cyber world what are you um exchanging what are you talking about are there regular meetings you interact can you tell us a little bit about it yes of course so uh, you have to try there are regularly meetings i myself be normally uh, twice a year uh, in the us i see my counterparts as they are coming here to to germany or uh, to europe for example, also during the so-called Munich Security Conference. So there are on the, let's say, on the executive side, there are exchanges, but there are also very technical exchanges uh, on preparing what is the right level of standardization, for example, on the way of artificial intelligence. What is the right level of standardization certification on high security areas like uh, 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 common uh, criteria certification? Or like, for example, the C5 standard or artificial intelligence C4 standard, um, there we're exchanging in-depth discussions, uh, one. Number two is, what is the right level? We always try to learn. When I'm always there meeting with the Department of State, 
with my uh, counterparts and within the administration, but also when I'm on the Congress or uh, uh, Senate, uh, um, there I'm always, always having the questions, hey, what are you doing in, in, in Germany or in Europe on the legislative side? So, so what can we learn from each other regarding um, how, how do you secure critical infrastructures, for example? And what is for you a critical infrastructure? How are you preparing if there's an attack? And there are also in-depth discussions. And last but not least, in case of an emergency, if something happened really, there we are having very, um, let's say, operational exchanges regarding the threats, but also how to react on this, like for example, on the, within the third community and so on. And therefore, I think it is more than just partnership, it's real friendship. Thank you. I have, uh, you said case of emergency, and I think we all remember, or in case you don't, the audience, uh, there was this huge ransomware attack on Colonial Pipeline, and it was like very critical, and I bet a lot of you also talked about, and there was some exchange. But Mrs. Franz, did this incident, or this almost a catastrophe, did it change something in the perspective, the public perspective, but also in the level of alert? you or you experienced in the United States? Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's nothing that focuses the mind like an incident that has uh, that has um, uh, implications for the public, right? Mm -hmm. So um, um, that the incident that addressed the colonial pipeline that had direct impact on what individuals see on a daily, you know, in their daily life is, uh, um, something that catches a lot of attention. Um, so yes, that was, it um, focused the mind, it focused some efforts, uh, as uh, Arnie said earlier, the, the do, you know, finding something to do, setting a plan and doing and implementing it. There was very rapid movement on, on addressing um, the colonial pipeline issue, uh, addressing the critical infrastructure aspects, and of course then ransomware as well. Um, so, uh, I think it, uh, once again, an incident has focused the mind. Um, but it did also prevent, present an opportunity, yet another opportunity for working together. I mean, as you said, we have been working um, across uh, the interagency contexts, both in the US and uh, Germany, whether it's working with our colleagues in the, our counterparts in the, um, uh, German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or whether uh, our incident response functions and CISA and and CERTs work together practically every day, I would say. Um, so we have been working on this full time for more, well, with regard to the sort of di diplomatic aspects of it for more than a decade, and uh, the incident response for several. So um, I think we have um, made important progress on both. Um, and in, the, in an incident like uh, Colonial Pipeline or any of the ones we've seen in recent uh, in the recent years, uh, we have been trying to make sure that we have both the incident response and technical connection, but also um, um, looking at it from a, a foreign policy. You know, here at the State Department, we look at it as a foreign through a foreign policy lens, and for over. A decade, we have been making important progress on defining what is the what is um, responsible behavior by state, states in cyberspace. So, while we have, um, you know, have to address an incident once it happens, we're also trying to set up what we have also been trying to set up the the what I what we would call the international environment. What is the expectation um, of the behavior of states in cyberspace? And we have had uh, quite success in doing that and setting up this framework that includes the applicability of international law to cyberspace, uh, a set of norms that um, uh, for responsible state behavior in peacetime and what we call confidence building measures. Things like who are our points of contact with each other? What are our national doctrines? So that's how we look at it from a foreign policy perspective. But yet, when an incident like that happens, we want to be sure that uh, we have uh, partnerships that we can work with to address it in a in a rapid way and 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 dealing with it uh, both in a public fashion and in the technical fashion. As 
is something that uh, we ha we work very closely with Germany on, as well as as well as others. And uh, we have a, um, as Anu said, we have l many opportunities to meet each other and under normal non-COVID times <laughs> uh, to address uh, to address any number of those issues, whether it's in a UN meeting or a, a conference of the international response. Uh, the Forum for Inter Incident and Security Response Teams is a global uh, a, a global community. Um, there's no shortage of meetings and opportunities to to meet, but we also have a regular ongoing uh, interaction uh, bilaterally as well. One thing that I didn't mention earlier is that um, to your question about how often we get together, we have had an ongoing U.S. Germany cyber dialogue. Um, and uh, while we have had that addresses thing, uh, uh, cyber issues across sort of the spectrum of foreign policy and incident response and capacity building um, and uh, things like that, um, that we are looking forward to revitalize in early 2022, hopefully in person. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Schoenmann, the Colonial Pipeline was a very heavy incident and I think uh, you also ask yourself, I would presume, what would happen if that, if that happened in Germany? So my question is not, could that happen in Germany? My question is, um, it was very present. Everyone could experience that something is bad, that something bad happened. So is it um, a f part of, un of the public unawareness when it comes to cyber incidents that it's not in the real world, that it's very disconnected from, from the daily basis? Is that where our unawareness in certain fields comes from when it comes to economy, for example, or private people? Uh, I think you're right. Yes, absolutely. The, the challenge within cyber is, or cyber attacks is, you don't see it, you don't smell it, you don't taste it. The only issue what you're seeing is the result of a cyber attack. You saw it within Colonial Pipeline, you saw it regarding the billing and so on system there. You saw it within the hospitals. You know, be, because IT is so, it is so normal that it is working, that everything is running, running on it, but we don't understand quite clearly how, how much we are depending on IT, on, on working IT. And it is fascinating when you're having small children and you ask them, how are you going from A to B? They put it on a certain kind of navigator. I, I will not make any advertisement, but you know what I mean. And put it down and they will, will go exactly to where they have to go. But if this is not working, they don't know how to, how to use even a normal map in former times. So this is, we became more and more dependent on this one. We, within the colonial pipeline, we understood that this is not just hypothetical, and it had been the same on all the different attacks, uh, wanna try and non-petia and so on before that. So, but this is also questioning how our real li life is depending on working IT. And therefore, for me, it became very clear, and that's why I'm so grateful that the German government understands it so well, that information security is not a cost factor, but information security is a precondition of digitization. That's, that's what we see every day. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Franz, you are on the other side, like Mr. Schumann is the interior and from the title and from the organizational background, and you're then the foreign politics. So are you also raising awareness uh, among your colleagues or are you advising and helping them to understand? Because like Mr. Schumann said, the US and Germany, they are friends, but they are certainly not all over the world, they are friends. So what are you, how are you advising, how are you helping your colleagues to understand cyber diplomacy? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, since, um, well, I don't know, we've always had a very strong interagency uh, collaboration across the departments and agencies dealing with various aspects of the cyber problem. As you noted earlier, um, uh, or perhaps in the introduction to the, se to the session, there was a question about 
um, having uh, a number of agencies or departments that might be dealing with any aspect of, of uh, cybersecurity. Um, so we have had a very, I guess, robust <laughs> interagency discussion for many years. However, it became much more formalized um, about 10 years ago or more uh, in a um, in a, a deliberative process that uh, that the interagency works on um, and included developing an international engagement strategy and it included developing a cyber deterrence strategy. And both of those efforts have required a lot of engagement with our um, interagency partners, including how we might address um, uh, malicious behavior in cyberspace, what kinds of things can we do, what countries that we can partner with, and how we determine as a government when we might um, publicly attribute uh, any cyber incident to, to another state. Um, and all of those um, deliberations have been a very uh, um, active engagement process over the course of the past few years and resulted in not only building awareness from from our side about to our colleagues in the in the government about our uh, um, what we might do with partners internationally, but also what for example, the law enforcement community does with their partners globally, or what the incident response community does with their partners globally. So pulling all that together in this sort of deliberative process to come up with to come up with processes that we can that are repeatable and that we can rely on over time. Um, so I would say that that awareness has sort of been in, uh, intrinsic in that in those uh, interagency processes. And it has been very useful to formalize the um, internal process for deliberation on things like a, a public attribute, a political attribution we might do um, uh, to, an, to another state. As part of that, we have been building um, our partnerships with uh, other countries or a coalition of countries that are willing to um, engage in that discussion. Um, and what to do about it, whether or not it's a political attribution, whether there are additional consequences that can be imposed on uh, states that are transparent, that are um, um, it reversible if need be, and how we can utilize those things to really deter uh, states from taking that kind of activity in the future. So that is uh, an ongoing activity. Um, so I would say it's ongoing awareness as well. Uh, but that engagement with our interagency is very, uh, very robust, regular, and deliberative, I'd say. Thank you. So I have tons of questions, but I think I will open up now for questions from the audience, if you have any. Otherwise, I would continue with my questions. Oh, we have one question here. I think we need a microphone. Microphone is coming. Hi, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm with the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace. And Leslie mentioned already the uh, uh, um, achievements uh, in the open-ended working group and the group of governmental experts in the United Nations. So, uh, but there is a second process now in, under the third committee of the General Assembly, uh, which is the negotiations on the uh, Cybercrime Convention will, will start in January. So uh, both Germany and the US have favored for many, many years the Budapest Convention, and we have just signed the second protocol. So uh, do you expect that something will come out from the UN process, in particular if it goes against ransomware or an attribution? Thank you. Do you want me to start? <laughs> yes, I think you, you nodded, so yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry I can't see you, Wolfgang, but uh, nice to hear from you. Um, the, uh, well, yes, it is, um, the third committee process will start in January and we have been um, uh, obviously following that very closely and wanting to make sure that the modalities for this discussion are, are acceptable and it, it, it um, uh, our support and um, 
promotion of the of the Budapest Convention has not waned at all. And in fact, I think uh, it would be very useful, continue to be useful to refer to um, the the Budapest Convention as as uh, not only um, the existing but increasingly um, uh, adopted by other countries uh, as the as the as the standard for dealing with uh, global cybercrime issues. Um, so as we look towards those negotiations, we're looking at them very carefully for the right modalities, keeping the scope where it needs to be uh, in this discussion, not letting things uh, creep into other areas of cyberspace. Because one thing that we also uh, believe is that applicable, that existing international law is applicable to cyberspace and we don't need uh, another legal instrument or treaty to address cyberspace writ large. So keeping the scope and the uh, um, the parameters for this uh, cybercrime uh, negotiation will be important to us. Thank you. Did you answer your question? Perfect. So Mr. Schumann, I know you have to leave in five minutes. So um, is there a question that Mr. Schumann should answer before he leaves us? Any questions from the? No. Okay. Then I have a, another. Then I have a question, and my question is: um, the U.S. Is, are very um, bold when it comes to, comes to naming and shaming, which comes from uh, attribution cap capacity and a very very strong system there. Um, do you think that we need to be better with our attribution cap capabilities, or do we need a European concert to to foster that? I think we have the appropriate capabilities what we need for. For example, if you remember well, um, before the German elections, um, the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs made a very clear attribution um, towards uh, a state, a different nation, regarding not to interfere with, with the German elections. So this is something what they have made very clear. The question is, uh, and that's a very political question, do we need it? to be better in the future. Sometimes it's good to say, to attribute someone and say, yes, stop, because we are watching you on the one hand. On the other hand, to be very clear, I, I'm not so much afraid regarding the state actors. We, we see there day by day between 350 to 550,000 new malware programs, new malware programs. And most of them are coming out from organized crime. So this is for us a challenge. And if you are uh, an, an outlaw, you don't care regard any convention or attribution. You just do it for earning some money. So, so this is for me, let's say, so these are the two pillars we are facing. And this is something we have both to be on a safe side. And therefore, I think, um, yes, if we do it on a European scale, I think it would be appropriate. But then there, the evidence has to be very, very clear and not just to, uh, with a certain kind of margin. Trans the attribution thing, is that something, um, can you attribute a state that easily? Because every attacker will hide between like a single person or a group, like uh, Mr. Schumann said, someone who's not linked to a state or will say, well, we're just doing it for money and not for political uh, or ideological reasons. Uh, to whom is the question? Is it to, to me? Or sorry, Mrs. To, France. To, to, to sorry, Mrs. France. Well, certainly it, um, uh, it certainly matters to um, how we respond uh, publicly or politically um, based on the actor, um, which is why we take a very careful approach to um, determining, you know, making making a, either a technical attribution on the one hand, um, which, um, you know, we used to say attribution is very hard. Um, but I think that, um, as Arne mentioned, there's more and more capability for, for doing that. Um, and the fact that we work together um, bilaterally and across other, with other countries and communities is very, uh, very helpful in that regard. But also, it also 
when you're um, doing a political attribution or a public attribution or talking about ad addressing the act, the actor, um, uh, it it may not be that you have to have every um, every piece of evidence that you might have to have in 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 the technical attribution if you're following the trends if you're following the the uh, the um, following the money, say, uh, to be able to at least identify that there is malicious behavior um, and uh, can condemn the behavior, even if you can't go as far as calling out a specific actor. But as you um, have seen, the United States has done um, both political attribution to another state and also uh, called upon states to address what might the criminal uh, activity that might be coming from their territory, uh, particularly in uh, the recent ransomware cases. So there's varying ways that you can address um, the actor, the problem, and the and the um, acti the malicious activity that is, that is uh, going uh, happening. And I would say that the um, it's it's one thing for either one country like the United States or uh, Germany to to make such an attribution, but it has far more impact if there are if there is a community of countries that are able to make um, an attribution or a public statement about the behavior, or the actor, or or the um, activity. Um, and so that is why we're working so closely with a number of countries and with the EU and utilizing uh, their diplomatic their diplomacy toolbox. Um, to to expand the landscape of countries that are are making such statements because that makes it much harder for either denial or um, for um, any one state or actor to retaliate uh, because the the landscape of countries that are standing up is so broad. So that is why we continue to to work with uh, Germany and other countries to do that. Thank you. So I have a question from the online audience, and it's about um, how do you get top talent for democracy, but also, I mean, uh, technology, um, when it comes that a private sector can pay much more than a state can? Mr. Schumann, do you want to start? Yes. So, so we are. When I have been younger than I'm currently young, um, so uh, 30 years ago, something, um, and I started to go into business. It had been the time of Michael Douglas and Wall Street, this kind of movie. Greed is good and so on, you know? So at this, this time, the young generation at this time wanted to earn money. That's the core of most of it. Today, the young generation, I understand, is very different. They like to earn some money, but they love to do something good. And they like to have a challenge. And they like to have a combination between, on the one hand, a professional life and a family life. So to bring it all together. So, so there, I think the generation has changed. And this is exactly why we within BSI are having no big challenges regarding getting the right people, because you're getting a perfect possibility to train yourself. You are the spearhead of, let's say, new technologies, and you do something good for your country. And this is something, and then you have a, a right work-life balance. And this is something what is most important for them, and it is much more, making much more fun than just earning some money, doing some database, uh, let's say, analytics behind it. So this is very boring, and this is what the young people understand. And therefore, we are getting the right people but the more challenging is regarding um, lifetime training and educating. So after hiring them, that's a bigger challenge from my perspective. I can hear the words purpose like in there. Mrs. Franz, would you like to, to, to add something? Oh, well, I'm glad to hear if the, um, that there is optimism for this younger generation, um, because I do think that, that uh, I, um, you know, I think for many, 
building up the workforce is a challenge, not just here in the United States, but other countries as well. And we we often get asked about how how uh, we can build that up. Obviously, a lot of it has to do with the education programs and the curricula that are put forward. And um, we have um, had an initiative um, in the government to deal with um, our education curriculum and uh, um, focus specifically on how to build up the cybersecurity um, uh, cadre of professionals. Um, I would say from a diplomatic standpoint, um, we also are seeing some um, um, uh, desire to do something for your country. And um, I think it's also too important, important to understand that not everybody that works on cybersecurity and certainly not everyone that works on cyber policy has to be a technical person. Yes, we probably have to have a little bit of understanding of um, the, trans, you know, the translation between the technical and the policy aspects. But uh, for example, we find ways to uh, train our foreign service officers who are in embassies um, abroad to address the cyber policy issues that we have, or how to how to uh, work with the um, the element, what elements in any particular government may be dealing with cybersecurity and cyber policy issues. Um, so we've been proud of that part of uh, training our diplomats, um, but uh, that's a whole different um, sort of multidisciplinary way of looking at it. We also have a um, we also have a program in the government for uh, recruiting um, students from college into a program for uh, service. You know, we pay for their, the government pays for their college and then they ha have to serve in the government uh, in a cybersecurity capacity for a few years. And that has been very helpful, but um, I'm not sure that anyone would say it meets the need. Uh, so we're still we still find ways to fi finding um, exploring ways to to recruit <laughs> recruit and retain the talent because I think that's another issue, not Thank just you. getting them in but keeping them in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I just so have to step out. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I just have to step out. <laughs> we are eight I'm sorry. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Schumann. Good to see you. Bye. So, so we are over time. So I would close our exciting panel now. Thank you so much, Mrs. Franz, for your time and your expertise and your insights. And thank you all for listening. And um, back to you, Stormy.